Hello, 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 everybody, you all. It has been an amazing week for 4910 Rosalie Productions, y'all. It has been amazing. We have had detangled the vote. I don't know if you all have been able to watch any of our past lives this week, but I really hope that you're able to go back and watch. And for this a short break, we wanted to just end the week with the amazing bang. I'm so excited for today. A short break is back because you all know we took a week off last week and I am so excited to be here and we can just go ahead and get it rolling. Damien, how are you? Well, I am doing okay right now. Just okay. I'm just happy to be back on a short break. Hey, what's up, people? Hey, what's up, audience, and all the folks that tune in from all around the world? Matter of yeah, fact, hey, while we get we talking around the world, can we get a check in? Can we get a check in where folks are from and what areas and around the country you are visiting or watching the short break from? We would appreciate it. We got a comment already. Boom! Guess who checked in with us? Hi, <laughs> Neil. How you doing, girl? Yeah, but speaking of Nia, speaking of Nia, uh, here at 4910, we put together, like you were saying, the Tangle to Vote. Uh, it was a great week, and we are really excited for everything that came out. Some of the uh, came out from it, the conversations, the uh, yeah. the community, uh, the information. It was, it was, it was. T you tell tell us how you feel about it, Emma. What what's any thoughts that you know that sparked your mind from this week? Anything you want to share with the people? It was just a great week. I learned so much about just the Crown Act in general. I learned and met so many different women from different backgrounds. We all talked about our hair, whether we have our, you know, super professionals or just now getting into the job that we're in, whether it was mothers or politicians. So it was really cool to be able just to be a part of so many different conversations with Black women. And we also had an amazing Black men's panel. So it was really great to hear their perspective on their love for Black women and then just promoting the fact that we need to go out and vote. So I really enjoyed that. Um, Mia said, Citizen She and Nola was so excited for this. And I know I definitely was excited. And I love that we had people in so many different time zones. We had people in so many different places who were a part of it. So I really enjoyed this week. Yeah, it, it, it was it was it was pretty dope. And I was and for me being able just to sit back and just watch and prepare everything from the from the from the background and help help uh, push the uh, narrative forward by taking a step back it was it was the the position that I was in was very interesting and, and i really enjoyed just seeing what all flourished uh from what came out of what we put together man I mean, it, was, it was really really dope really really dope man congratulations and you emma did and wait a minute, this one you emma did an amazing job Sat well, back thank you. you and Nia had chemistry y'all were talking and i was sitting back like look at emma boy she is gonna take over everything I won't be on this show no more. She take this over and every all Mom, the other. We need you for this show, so <laughs> you can't go anywhere because there would be a show without you. So, oh. Oh. but thank you. I really appreciate it. It was really, really, really a good week. I'm gonna yeah, like really. go back and rewatch all of the video. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. All of all of the uh, conferences, all of the panels, everything that we've done, the, the, the beauty of it is that you can go back and rewatch it. You can go to the 4910 Rosalie Facebook page. You can go to the Citizen She United Facebook page and check out everything that we, uh, all the programming that we have available for you right, right now for free. I'm just saying, you can do it right now. If you go see it, you can see it for free now. Listen, because, go ahead and click that button. Go ahead and subscribe. Go ahead and follow, like. Yeah, follow, and yeah. follow the 4910. The, uh, follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, everything. But, okay, let's get to what's happening this week. You want to start off, Emma? Um, yeah, it is a lot going on. Um, I know we want to get into our show, but we try to put in just, you know, one or two interesting facts that are happening over, um, you know, in entertainment land. So one of the things that is happening is that Issa Rae will host Saturday Night Live. You mm -hmm. all, that is, that's actually a pretty big thing as 
they don't let that many, you know, black women host <laughs> Saturday Night Live. I believe she will be the 13th black woman to host it. And I'm just really, really excited. I'm excited to see how it's going to happen. And just, Justin Bieber will be um, her musical guest. So, and they just had Chris Rock host and Megan Thee Stallion was the guest for that one. And her set was everything. And she uh -huh. made a statement in terms of Black Lives Matter with her background. So I really love that she's using her platform um, to just, you know, raise her, to raise her voice and elevate that. But I'm excited for Issa Rae. I love Issa Rae. Okay. <laughs> Listen, Issa Rae is that person. I love her, her from her going from just YouTube to, to now being, having her own multiple shows on TV. I am an Issa Rae. Fan. It's been doing her thing for a while. It's always it's always dope when you can just go back and see um, from the beginnings again, like from the beginnings and where they come from and how they've been making things happen. She's been pushed. I remember riding up, like pulling up on her at a gas station on Venice and La Brea. Just and she's getting gas. And I was like, and then she was just, I think it was right after Awkward Black Girl. And you're like, what else is like what you're doing? You're doing things. She's like, all right, thanks. And we was just putting out regular. <laughs> Regular cars. I bet a car is much different now. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is because listen, them checks that she getting, she is getting movie checks, host checks, producing, directing checks. She all getting all the checks. checks. Okay, so yeah. them checks are looking real, real, real different right now. I know. Um, so I'm gonna take a second and talk about this next thing that's that saddens me. Um the good brother Thomas Jefferson Burke. His brother Thomas Jefferson Bird is the man. He's the man. He's the man. He um yeah. Thomas Jefferson Bird was a brother that I knew from New York. Um theater theater uh guy, film guy, TV guy. As we all know, one of Spike's a guy from you know Clockers, Girl Six, get on a bus, you know, bamboozled. Red Hook Summer, you know, you can tell he was a true legend in this game. And um, man, I remember, you know, I got some, some really good memories hanging out with Thomas. Uh, I was I had the pleasure of knowing the brother and 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 kicking it with the brother. Um, shout out to NASA Metcalf. I knew him. We used to go down to his house. We have fight parties, watch everything. Uh, I remember actually hanging out with Thomas, Thomas, NASA, Shelby, and Prince. Like we were. We were like um, really enjoying ourselves. It was it was a good time. I mean, that's he was a real straight up legend. We hang out at the St. Nick's Jazz Pub. It, it, it's just so many different times and so many different instances that we were all together. And Thomas was, you know, giving out great information. Always gave good advice. It was, it was and it was just really good seeing a, seeing a brother that had made it in my eyes when I was especially in New York running around and still being like true to form and being true to who he is and true to what you would hope him hope he to him to be. Um, and uh and when it came down to it, he was just an OG in the game. He was a 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 black man that, that just had a talent and skill. And um and we're gonna miss this brother man. It's horrible what just happened to him and what we and what's uh transpiring man. RIP to Thomas Jefferson Bird man legend. We missed this brother man. I'm gonna miss him. Sad, sad, sad day. Sad, sad day. Yeah. So we had to speak up on that. <laughs> yes. And sometimes we have to give sad information in terms of our, you know, hot topics. But the reason why we are all here is all because of a short break, which is where we're going to go into now. I know you've yes, all been waiting and I'm super excited. Today we have Angela Tucker. Um, of all skin folk and kin folk. Angela. Hi, how are you? I am well. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. We're happy to have you. We are excited to show this. Um, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen it this way, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay. I haven't watched it for so long. I mean, you know, when you make a film, you just kind of, uh, so it's going to be fun to watch it again. And, you know, we got to tell you something. You have the privilege, and no, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. we have the privilege of having you, your film, Skin Folks, 
as the first docu short on a short break. You or I oh. know a novel short film on a short break. Yes. Oh, wow. Not too short. I yes. wish we had like confetti and clues yes. bomb and like <laughs> yes, all that, all that. Look at that, make it rain. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we want to say thank you, thank you for doing this. You know, and also since you are, see, we're talking about the first. We do this segment called "From the Beginning," mm -hmm. and we would like to ask you a couple questions. Okay. Um, and we may not ask you all of them, but we ask you a couple of questions, put you on the hot seats so the audience will get to know you a little more, your people will get to know you a little more, um, and you know, just hype it up. So here we go from the beginnings with Angela Tucker. Okay. Well, I started off with the first with the first question. We might not get through all of them, but we get through some of them. And the first one I'm going to go with: When did you realize that you were a director, Angela? Oh, um, well, when I was in high school, I really wanted to be an actor, but every time I would audition for things, you know, I went to a predominantly white high school, and so uh, there would never be any parts that were right for me. So I finally just said, you know what, I'm just going to direct something, and I don't even need to be in it. And once I did that, I was hooked. I was like, that's that's it. That's what I want to do. This is This is it for me. So it was probably then in high school. Mm, mm. High school. She said high school was it. High school was it. All right. Okay. Good answer. Yep. Good answer. Uh, Emma, do you want to take the next one? Yeah. So the next question that I have is where did you get money for the first short film that you shot? Or where did you get the money from the first film you shot ever? <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, the first short film I made, I went to film school at Columbia for grad school. And so my student loans were how I got money for the first short film that I made. Uh, yeah. <laughs> pretty much, I mean, you know, I just uh, used some of my student loans and uh, got people to do things for free and got equipment and uh, tried not to use too many, but that's really how I got the first batch of money to do my first hey. terrible short. Oh, no. you know what? It's so funny though, where, where some of this money come from. Cause I've, I've heard so many different stories like, hey man, my buddy has some equipment. So I just, went there. listen, I can tell you how I did one of my short films. Mm -hmm. and you can tell how my posturing that it wasn't completely <laughs> on up and up. But you know. Yeah, we, you uh, about to go to jail over there? You doing some no, 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 exactly no, limitations. Um, we, um, but it was, no, it was, we had, I was working on another job. We were doing something else. And we had like this long break. Uh, we had this long break, like a four day break within shooting because it was a holiday or something. And so this, and they didn't want to, this production company was uh, trying to save money so much that they didn't want to pay for a bonded lot that held all the equipment. And in my parking uh, garage, we had to go through two different gates to even get down. So I was like, you know, uh, you know, I got, I got, you got to go through two gates to get to mine. If you want, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it down there for you if you want. You know, uh, you know I made a deal of it. It's like, oh, oh, great, thank you. That saved us three hundred dollars or four hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that weekend we shot a whole movie with that equipment. Oh yeah, yeah. that's so smart. Yes, we shot a whole movie. Smart. With that equipment. <laughs> yes, because you know people were always trying to not put stuff in bonded lots, and you were just like. Uh -huh. Like a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. Yeah. Don't you think you pay to put it someplace? Okay. Cool. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. <laughs> That's so smart. It. That, that is a good idea. It. That's a good idea. Let me think about it. it, it, it it's going to be safe. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Um. So you know what? Are we gonna go? We're gonna take one more quick question. Um. From our section from the beginnings with you, Angela, and then we're going to jump right into it. So I'll take the next one. How did you feel wrapping the first project you ever directed? Like that last, and it's a wrap. And then AD, if it was one, said, It's a wrap, everyone. What was mm -hmm. that? Feeling? It was a great feeling because, you know, I mean, when I made my first film, it was a little bit ago, my first short film in grad school. It was kind of before they had affordable cameras and stuff. So I had to use, you know, school equipment. So I didn't really get to make anything for longer than I would have liked. Mm -hmm. It was just so satisfying also to have your vision or 
to the best of your ability, be like, you made the thing you've been thinking about making. It was it was really really exciting, and it was something I really liked the, the film that I made. So it, it was it's a satisfying feeling that you get over and over again when you make things if you're if you have a good experience. Yes. Yes, 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 it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We agree, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Look, look. She, she, she survived it, Emma. Was that too bad? Was that too bad? You no. did. You did no. really great. <laughs> Sometimes we have some people, they're like, what's the answer to the question? And you're yeah. like, um, this, this, and this. Any more, please? Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah, you were you you were ready to go. You you were primed up and ready to go. You know, I see you, you've done this before. How how how's the run been with the film? Oh, it's been great. I mean, it's been really beyond my wildest dreams. I mean, we I mean it premiered really at this point almost it'll be two years ago in November. Oh. And you know, it's shown on public television. We've been in a lot of festivals. And then, you know, we've been doing all this engagement work to work, have the film be used as a tool to get people to try to, you know, promote getting out the vote and having Black women having sort of smaller conversations together about who are they voting for, why is it important to vote. So I, this was all I, I had dreamed for the film, and it really has happened. So I couldn't be happier. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. So we're going to go and get ready and go right into it. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction, tell you about the talk, speak about a short break. And after that, we'd love for you to go right into it. Actually. So check it out. We are about to start a short break. A short break is the intersectionality between the audience and filmmaker. We like the audience and the filmmakers to have a good time watching the film. And then after the film, we're going to start the film again, but we're going to play it on mute. And then from there, we're going to bring back the filmmaker back up and they're going to have a conversation about what's going on. Uh, kind of like a, let's say, a DVD commentary, you know, behind the scenes mm -hmm. where you can have the audience and the filmmaker ask these questions. And you as the audience can ask questions by clicking on, oh, sorry, by your chat or comments in Facebook or YouTube. And you can also get ask questions live and we'll put the link up soon. So without any further ado, we're going to bring up Angela, and we'll say a couple words before we jump into it, Angela. Wow. Well, I just thank you so much uh, for having me again. And, you know, just enjoy the film and just kind of let it wash over you. And we'll talk more about it when it's done. All right. There we go. We need your vote because if I'm elected as Congresswoman, things will be different. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we are tired of people saying that we are satisfied because we are everything but satisfied. We're going to ask a few personal questions and each candidate will have one minute to respond. And the first question uh, is going to be, what one thing do you admire about each of your opponents, both personally and professionally? Judge Bagnaris. When you look at your opponents, uh, I believe that uh, Constable Cantrell is a very, very good mother. And for Judge Charbonnet, she has great taste in shoes. <laughs> You know, I thought having 
two black female candidates would be this sort of transformative moment where I felt like I was really kind of seen in a way I hadn't been, but somehow I didn't really feel that way. Desiree Charbonnet and Latoya Cantrell are heading to a November mayoral runoff. I am from New Orleans. I am from California. I'm from here. I'm from Gentilly. I'm from upstate New York. This is home. My mom was buried here. My grandma's buried here. My roots are here, and everything that I love about myself is here. So I think it's fantastic that we've ended up in a runoff between two women considering that there were males in the race as well. It's also important for them to continue to represent that change can happen and that we just need to be diligent and we need to stay to the course. If she wins, I will definitely be excited to see how she uses her platform. Like, I'm going to cast my ballot for a black woman, and it's going to feel good to me. Desiree Charbonnet has really been the front runner in this race. She's garnered the most support or endorsements and has raised the most money, more than $1.3 million. They both strike different visuals. One is sharp and polished in physical appearance. One of them is like high fashion. The other is sort of, you know, folksy, regular people in physical appearance. Regular, you know, like boots on the ground, let's get this done. If you want to get things done, you've got to fight for it. Latoya Cantrell, mayor. And then one of them kind of speaks more, you know, genteel and poised and, you know, that kind of stuff. I am the only candidate who sat on the bench and looked crime in the face day in and day out for a decade. And the other sort of speaks real emphatically, almost even like in the uh, cadence of like a sermon. So I am not running to be the first of anything, but I am running to be the best mayor that we need to lead New Orleans forward. So Desiree is a longtime community servant who started off her career as a beloved judge in the city, and she's well respected. I'm Desiree Charbonnet. When it comes to reducing crime, failure is not an option. That she's been groomed in the city's historical black middle class. Uh, she'd be more like an establishment candidate if we were in other cities. Hi, I'm Montana Mike. I'm here with Desiree Charbonnet. Ms. Charbonnet, I've heard many rumors that you're considering running for mayor. My experience on the bench, understanding crime, understanding, you know, the root causes of crime is important for the city. And a better day for Desiree Charbonnet for mayor of New Orleans. I would say for Latoya, she is also a known quantity in particularly around the fight for bringing equity uh, to the city. After Katrina, as many were still reeling from the storm and brought more, Latoya Cantrell was working, spearheading efforts to jumpstart recovery in her neighborhood, an area of the city that was not slated to return. You know, we are committed to our city. And in 2012, she won a special election for City Council District B. Now the residents are really just looking for her to deliver. 
Hey guys, and welcome to the 504. I'm Sheba Turk, and as we all know, early voting is underway for the November 18th elections, which means the big runoff for mayor. I wish we could talk about a lot more tonight. We are out of time, so I just want you guys to leave voters if they go into the polls and are still undecided when they think Councilwoman Latoya Cantrell, why should I vote? Give me a quick thought. Well, Councilwoman Cantrell has been in the forefront of affordable housing, economic development, neighborhood stabilization. I'm a proven leader with a proven track record of getting things done for our people. I'm asking for your vote so that we can get the job done. Thank you. All right, Judge Desiree Charbonnet, when they walk in there, what should they think? You should vote for me because I have a proven record of leadership in this community for the last 20 years. I have a vision for a city with a work-class development program like no other. Think clearly. Think about who is going to represent you here in the city of New Orleans. It is my staunch belief that the vote is our most promising means of accomplishing equality in Mississippi and in any other state which allows for discrimination. Black women are tried and true as we've always been, particularly with our loyalty to Democrats showing up at the booth. Um, it's a tradition I think that we have, it's a, it's a tradition that is important and I feel as if as a black person I have a debt that I owe to to my ancestors. Somebody bore a whip, somebody picked cotton and tobacco, somebody was raped, somebody did these things because I, I now have the freedom to, to live my life as an individual in this country. So there is a long tradition of black women always showing up and voting once we advanced in the suffrage movement. And then there's the cohort of black women that really never voted or were empowered or knew how to or who are now coming out and voting uh, because the marginalization that, that we're feeling and seeing is still playing out. It's kind of those two types of black women voters coming together. So I think black women in general have put in the diverse, uh, more progressive, more liberal people in office. Earlier today, we heard the beginning of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. We the people. It's a very eloquent beginning. But when that document was completed on the 17th of September in 1787, I was not included in that we the people. I felt somehow for many years that George Washington and Alexander Hamilton just left me out by mistake. But through the process of amendment, interpretation, and court decision, I have finally been included in We the People. So Jarvis, what have been the dominant issues that voters in New Orleans want to see the next mayor address? Uh, the streets are horrible, as they've always been horrible. Crime is bad, as it's been bad for a long time. Uh, economic development is not where people want it to be. Uh, a lot of people are complaining about the intrusion of Airbnb that's really destroying the character of a lot of New Orleans neighborhoods. So those are the issues. Well, one thing I do hope that, uh, I hope black folks turn out uh, in New Orleans, uh, regardless of who they vote for. Do you know who you're gonna vote for? I'm probably one of those anomaly people who doesn't vote along a party line specifically or things like that. I really am a person who pays attention to what is said, which is why this race has been particularly difficult for me because as I've watched the televised debates and things of that nature, I get frustrated that I don't feel that things are being stated in concise and clear forms. With breaking news, Motoya Cantrell's use of a city credit card. City credit card. Credit card. What he calls questionable spending. About $9,000. $642,000 in charges. The travel expenses were political and personal expenses, including 30 trips around the country. There was no findings of any wrongdoing. Oh, look at that. Out of control. Not financially responsible. Black woman over there. She's going to steal money from you to pay her bills, right? Charbonne gave contracts to elected officials. And if she's mayor, city contracts would go to you, lucky few. This narrative that Desiree is the mouthpiece for this political group that wants to get back into City Hall and give contracts to their friends. 
throughout this entire campaign, there have been no promises to anyone. They would never say that about a black man or even a white man or any other man. Says she's gonna get skin in the game, she's gonna have low hanging fruit, boots are gonna be on the ground. I know that for sure about her. There's Ray Charbonnet and Latoya Cantrell throwing shade at one another. The leanings of our local media publications deeply, deeply shape discourse about these candidates in ways that hasn't been as obvious with other races. Like we have two black candidates, we have two black female candidates, the vote for them is not split on like racial and economic lines in ways that we can recognize. So what do we do? Like none of our stories hold up. This is a whole new genre. I think just stating I'm a black woman, it's not even safe for us to really say our issues on those platforms. And it's interesting watching this race and seeing these women go through the same exact thing of talking around the issue and not really seeing things that I know they're thinking, you know? And if we can't even state who we are, how can we talk about anything else? Everything else would just be a performance. Because of the ingrained racism and sexism that is in our political culture, Neither candidate could come out and say, I am a black woman, I am running for this office, and champion issues and ideas and thoughts um, that put black women as a whole at the forefront. I think some of the things that are important for me as a black woman are the same things that are important for citizens generally. How you handle the criminal justice system here Okay, so like crime, we got crime. There are things you can do to mitigate and make crime less. But are you going to get in there and solve crime? I kind of think you're not. Somebody in this damn city needs to talk about the shoddy education system. Even though black women are the most educated in America, we're also still underpaid compared to white women, right? And there's still a significant number of us living below the poverty line. I need better healthcare policies, but I ain't got time to think about all that because all these other issues are plaguing my life. I feel our Black people in New Orleans have been pushed out so quickly. We owe it to the people who are from here to be able to stay here. The cathedral will still be there. The Superdome will still be there. The river will still be there. But the people that give it that, New Orleans, no other place in the world flavor, those people are slowly but surely gone. We are also the highest voting population in this state and in this city, but we don't have the representation to reflect that. So the idea that our mayor, regardless of the outcome, is gonna be a black woman, we're all excited, however. And so when we talk about reform or change or um, doing something in a way that is supposed to be good for everybody, we also have to recognize that the women as a whole, if they're not addressed specifically, they're being left out. And if Black women aren't addressed specifically apart from white women, then we're being left out. And we were left out of those conversations and that dialogue on a consistent basis. We shouldn't just be thanking women of color for electing progressive leaders. We should be electing women of color as those leaders. What? to people who share experiences that we have owed to us once they obtain a position of power, right? And I think in some ways we still believe that electing folks who look like us, who share experiences with us perhaps, will be put into positions of power and the work that they do there will be informed by those experiences. 
And so I think we're voting that way still. I'm voting that way. So even though there are parts of me that know that isn't always true. And in fact, there are things that suggest that once a person who has been formally oppressed obtains some sort of power, they then adopt the tools of the white power structure and use them against people who they used to be like. I, I, I'm not sure that black and brown folks in positions of power can resist using tools of white supremacy once you are inside of that system of power. I don't need somebody to tell me what it means to be black. I really don't. I actually think it's the height of prejudice to assume that you know what people think because of their color and that you have the right to design their lives for them and to tell them what they will think or do. That's the height of prejudice and the height of uh, hubris, really. Uh, if you are just joining us, uh, we are awaiting the arrival of uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor elect Latoya Cantrell. I think Latoya won because she did a lot of work behind the scenes. So she went door to door. She did a lot of face to face time with people and that made her feel more down to earth. And I think that that really made the difference. I don't think that her being mayor makes the city Gucci. Um, that's a lot of responsibility to put on one person and it's in our hands. And I think it could help, but it's not the answer. So prior to coming out, I did have an opportunity. I received a call from Ms. Charbonnet, Desiree Charbonnet. And I said to her, congratulations on standing with me on making history because our history was two women who made that runoff and we both deserve to be proud of that we have spoken the people of our city have spoken and no one will be left out no one will be left behind because we're focused on the future of the city of new orleans where all of us matter this has been the people's campaign from day one I started this campaign going, listening to our people, hearing your cry, but also understanding that we are in a true position to ensure that we are no longer about the haves and the have nots, that we are going to ensure that our city continues to grow and be strong and give real opportunity that pie is getting larger so that each and every one of us can share in it. So that each and every one of us can win in our city. So this win tonight is not for me nor my family. This win tonight is for the city of New Orleans. Yes, absolutely. short break that was so we're going to go into this real quick all right i'm gonna tell people what a short break is we talked about it but we can real quick so we are about to start our short break of people again this is when sorry about that this is when the audience has a chance to re-watch the film which we are and they can have a conversation with the filmmaker ask whatever questions and then that filmmaker can actually uh, give us some insight on some, you know, things that was happening in the film while they were filming and things like that. So we are really happy to get this going and uh, appreciative. So without any further ado, we're going to bring up 
Miss Angela. Hey, Angela, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you feel right now after seeing it? Good, good. I thought it would be weirder to see it again, but um, but I, I, I still, I'm still proud of it. You still it's proud good, of it? I'm still proud of it. Yeah, yeah. You should be still proud of it. So we're gonna get, we're gonna start it, and we're gonna start it again on mute this time. And then there we go. And then we can start. For Tucker Girl, is that your? So is this your production company? Yeah, it's my production company. Um, and Black Public Media is they are a funder public television that people should know about. They fund black projects. Okay. Uh, they do a lot. Of, so look them up. Uh, they gave me the funding for the film. I'd apply for it, but they gave me money for it. So it was great. Nice. And I, I quit, so that, so this being our first documentary, we could ask questions that we didn't get to ask on with our, with our regular, uh, with our narrative shorts. Mm -hmm. So coming to your, this historical footage, right? So you had to get so talk to some of these documentary filmmakers out here that <clears throat> they have that would like to get historical footage. What is the what process that you have to go through in getting your getting the licensing and the rights for that historical footage? So it's complicated. Um, there's a few things. First, uh, I had I worked with an archivist, and uh, they found a well, no, actually. I worked with an arch archivist, they found a bunch of stuff. But even before that, when this election was happening, I was pulling stuff off YouTube. Uh, I was just like, you know, I knew I needed the debates. I knew I needed all of the stuff. And it's hard to get that stuff later because local news stations pull it after a certain period of time because they don't have the bandwidth to like keep it online forever. Mm -hmm. So you have to get it right when it's happening. So I grabbed all of that stuff. And then I hired an archivist to get other stuff uh, that I didn't have. And then when I had the idea that I wanted to show the women from history, I looked online and then I also had the archivist get it. In terms of clearances, a lot of the older stuff, uh, my archivist had to go to um, houses, like archival houses, and I had to pay to clear a lot of the older stuff actually. The newer stuff, um, so there's a statute called fair use and yeah. fair use is a legal statute that basically, uh, it's complicated, but it, it allows you to use footage without clearing it as long as you have like, a, you know, a kind of a rationale and my, so I had to get a, make a fair use claim for a lot of the footage because I'm making a statement about media and how black women are reflected in the media. So I have like a, a claim for that. And then... Also, with a lot of the um, the debates and stuff, all of that's just public access. So anyone can use that in any way they want to. So it's kind of an involved answer, but it, it it's there's a lot of different ways to get it. Okay. Okay. The question I have is, what was the inspiration behind the title of the film, as well as your push for the film, since you did have to put a lot of you know power behind it in research and mm -hmm. money. Yeah, um, well, the title comes from a Zora Neale Hurston quote. Uh, so she said it's something along the lines of, she says all kinfolk gate skinfolk, actually. But uh, mm -hmm. so I had heard that line said in a, a group of Black women talking about, you know, an election. And they had said, well, you know, all skinfolk and kinfolk. And I said, that's the title. Uh, so uh, that's how I found the title. It took a long time to really settle on the title. I have a hard time with titles. Um, and I think it's important for short films to have titles that kind of grab you because there's so many shorts and shorts can just be, you know, like you're in a shorts program, there's so many films. So uh, I wanted something that would grab you. Uh, I got the inspiration because, you know, I am originally from New York City. I've been living in New Orleans for six years and I've never voted in an election um, this big between two black women. And I was struck by how a lot of my friends in town were kind of like, oh, sure. And I was like, what do you mean, oh, sure? This is this is so huge. Uh, and, you know, what I discovered was people were feeling a little ambivalent because of the way the media was representing women and how it was becoming really difficult to know what people stood for. Uh, so I just started to have conversations with, with my friends. Like I just had an audio recorder and I just 
recorded those conversations. And I always thought I would go back and do video interviews. But then I just kind of made this decision, like, why don't I make an election film that isn't necessarily exactly about the election in quotes, but is more about Black women getting a platform to vote, to voice the things that are important to them, which we never get to do in these sort of election spaces. So in doing that, it wasn't as important to do video interviews with people because I also feel like in short documentaries, when people do video interviews with a lot of people, you can't retain who they all are. So then you have to do things like Angela's at home when they just felt like dopey verite of me doing something in my house to like set up that this is me and this is what I'm into. And, and I feel like I would just be spending so much time doing all that dopey stuff when it wasn't really like what I want the movie to be about. So uh, that's kind of how I got the idea to have it be audio so that it can be kind of a chorus of women. And you, you kind of accept that it's a, like, you know, it's black women because there's a title card, but you also get that it's a chorus. Yeah, that was one thing that even throughout the film, it was like it popped up on my mind, like, okay, these are black women's voices. Because mm -hmm. in watching a doc or in watching anything mm -hmm. in general, you're so used to seeing that person pop up, that you know, that lower third at the bottom saying who they are. Mm -hmm. So I really, really enjoyed the fact that you use their voices. So now I'm really mm -hmm. listening because I can't do, you know, what our natural bodies do, just reading what they're saying on their lips while mm -hmm. I'm, you know, maybe eating or texting or something. I actually have mm -hmm. to pay attention. So I'm glad you gave the reason because I was going to ask and it mm -hmm. literally just like you said, I recorded one person and decided to go with that. So I thought it was like a deficit. Like you were like, okay, I'm going to do this. And it just so happened to just kind of happen. So yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. 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 I, you know what? Also um, within this, which I see you utilize a lot of uh, drone footage mm -hmm. when doing this. What, what Could you talk, did you have any issues with getting, um, so you know drone free zones because we we just finished up a documentary and we our drone our drone guy was really uh cautious he did not want to fly this he like i didn't have licenses and you got these frequencies you can't be on how was it with you in new orleans and getting the drone footage and everything yeah i mean we we went rogue uh quite a bit um but um we we were able to fly. So uh, first of all, I should say the idea for the drone footage was I wanted kind of to have footage where people could just see the city and also just reflect on what the women are saying in kind of a meditative way. And uh, I was talking to my producer and I was like, gee, I wish there was something that happened in town where a lot of black women came together and hung out. And it was literally like the day before Essence. And my, my producer was like, uh, I know what that is. Uh, so we hired a drone guy. Our drone guy just, was a little more fast and loose. Like, you know, you're not allowed to film in certain places in essence. So what we did was we would fly for a little bit and then they would say, you, you gotta take the drone down. And then I would chat with the guy for a while cause all you need is a little bit of footage. So I would chat with the guy for a while while the drone was still in the air. And then we would just yes. go to like different places. And, uh -huh. and you know, we filmed in the French Quarter and we were pretty low. I wanted low drone shots. Yes, so the, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh black women as opposed to the super high ones where people look like specs. So we had to be more conspicuous. Uh, so during Essence, it was, uh, that was kind of the most rogue we went. Then the stuff at the end was, um, we just went to different neighborhoods and we were pretty isolated. It was still pretty high up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think you have to find the drone person who is well, I have that life. Yeah, you gotta get a drone I person. Because, the drones a lot. Yeah, I, and they, you know. Yeah, because I'm loving your, uh, I loved your drone footage and I love your archival footage. I'm seeing you uh, with these cuts. Oh, this shot. Yeah, we used the shot in one of the videos. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's really, and it's very rich too. Did, did you, was it a, your, your, your color timing person? I know we get a little technical on certain things. Oh yeah, I, I, um, this, this conversation is for the people who know color timing, color correction is what making that orange pop the way it's popping. And you, yeah. and when you see certain things, you don't know that 
So if, when, when you when you look for it, you see that like this may be a little dull or these colors are not happening. They didn't get the color grade or color timing done if it wasn't the intention. So color timing is very important. So I see it and I when I recognize that I wanted to, you know, speak to you about it first to give you, you know, congrats on it, because I could see it was part of the character. It was it's a character on how you're telling the story. So oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, um uh -huh. it, it's a challenging film to color grade because of the different kinds of footage. So you have to kind of decide on a look and make everything, make the look for all of it consistent, you know? So, um, so, and then also we have a lot of filters. So we have like filters on things to make it look, like in the beginning, there's kind of a that film filter, that grainy filter, we put yeah. that over it um, to have it feel really stylized. And then we did also fast forwarding um, and so there's a device when they're talking about, um, you know, the, uh, what is it? The Latoya being thought that she took money and all of that, that sped up, but it's, so we had to speed it up in the edit and then also put a filter on it so you can see it. It's like a VCR and it's pretty slight, but yeah. I'll point out when it happens, but it, um, but yeah, it, it took, it took a while to. Oh, they gave her a belt? What New Orleans do it, bro? I, didn't see yeah, I was like, okay, now okay. I said, yes, they give her the belt before. <laughs> oh, wow. I know, I know. Well, New Orleans, yeah, so you yeah, know. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, you know what? Also, for the audience that's watching, my good people, if you would like to uh, chat a question, you can type. You can type it right into Facebook or YouTube, and it'll pop up, and we'll we'll get your question out. So, like for example, we have a question from. Mia Weeks. Cool. Want to take it, Emma? Yes. So oh. Mia says, how did you decide who to interview? Um, well, so I wanted, at first I just went with good friends, quite honestly. <laughs> at first it was like the, the, I have a lot of black female friends. So it started with people that I knew. Um, and then once I had, done a couple of friends, I started to get a little more strategic. I wanted it to be half people who were natives of New Orleans and half people who are transplants like me. Uh, and then trying to get diversity of age and just the way people sound, because it's a different process when you're using audio, because you want some people to have an accent versus some people that don't. Because in New Orleans, you know, some people have accents, some people don't. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, it really just became trying to have an even split between local New Orleans natives and transplants and, uh, and people who can speak to specific things, you know, um, one of the reasons that, um, Nia, who messaged Nia Weeks is, was chosen is because Nia could speak specifically about, um, issues that are important to black women in a very concise way. Um, yes, 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 we know that. Yes, we know that. Yeah. Very well. <laughs> yeah, you have to think about that stuff because, you know, you might have a friend who's entertaining, but they don't know how to tell a story or speak about what's important to them. Like, I, you know, I interviewed a lot of people and some of them didn't make it. And it was just, they just, you know, they didn't know how to speak in kind of a tight way. So. Oh, yes. I, That's we, real. We feel your pain because we we're, we're in the editing process now about wrapping up, wrapping up uh, Target, and you just want us try to squeeze everyone in that don't they gave their time, that donated their energies. I but, know, but it's like oh, you everybody won't it. make it. Everybody I, I won't make it. Everybody in, but there's like two friends that. I mean, they say a line, you know, but I just couldn't, I could, it, it just was, it was also partially me in terms of, we had conversations about so many different things that didn't make the film. Like a lot of people were talking about uh, Obama and having like him be the first black president and how that affects how we look at black politicians. And those were all interesting conversations, but those just never made it into the film. So if they talk mm -hmm. about that, they're yeah, not, here, here's you know, you're, 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 your low, your low drone, right, right here. Oh, you got it intimate into the into the streets, into the people. You feel it. 
It ain't like that aerial view where you, you know, we, this yeah. serves its purpose, but that mm -hmm. makes that more in your face. That makes you like, want to yeah. figure out what's like going I'm on. here. I'm actually yeah. in this city and I feel this pain. And I, I think this is actually where Nia's voice is. And I typed Nia's shout out to you. I was like, isn't that Nia's voice? <laughs> at me. I was like, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So we wanted to try to have it. We, it's kind of a mix of neighborhoods and then to kind of show like you're going very intimate, you're going wider. Um, and now you're kind of seeing the New Orleans that you used to see, which is well, like we all, we all wish to see this New Orleans again. This is after COVID. I'm see it. Um, one thing that I want to point out, you did, you actually had um, Kamala Harris uh, in this piece. And this was done way before she, you know, started to run for president. So for the people who might watch this now, do you get, you know, any any feedback on that now? Do you get like people might be hitting you up now like, oh, my gosh, you know, she's now running for president or a vice president. I knew she was going to run for president when I put that in. And it was way before I said that this yes. one is my president. I knew it. Um, so I didn't, I'm not going to say that, it, oh, I just happened to, it was, I mean, she had that bite and she was in this thing. Oh my God. What is it? She was in a conference. So it was like a small conference and I pulled that, that conference footage, um, Netroots, Netroots Nation, which is a small kind of political conference. And, you know, I, I just had a feeling. I just had a feeling. Uh, right here. Damn, you're yeah. going to pull it up real fast. And, you know, I didn't know she was going to be, you know, vice president candidate, vice president. Let's just speak it into existence. I didn't know she was going to be vice president, but, um, but I knew she would run for president. Mm -hmm. So yes, and I saw that. I say, yes, come on, Kamala. And then I say, oh, wow, this is actually done before. So I really, really, really enjoyed that. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, the next thing I was going to ask, did you get any pushback in terms of making your film or when you were looking for people to, I mean, you said majority of the people you interview were friends, but when you were trying to find different archival footage and you wanted to put this out about Black women, was there, was there any pushback at all? Yeah, I mean, the only pushback I would say is I think that some people, uh, I don't look at the film as it being two Black women against each other. I really look at it as, um, the story of how, as a system, we are still not ready to have two Black female candidates because we basically pit them against each other. We don't give them a space to speak on their issues. Um, and until we give Black women as a whole a space to speak on their issues, um, there's, it's going to be a problem. So I think that there are some people who look at the like, film, because I know the title does that, but um, they see it as too as it being two black women being pitted against each other. And so some people were like, I don't want to be a part of that. Or they felt like um, they didn't want it in the interview. They didn't want to say who they were going to vote for. And I, you know, I said to people, it doesn't matter who you vote for. Mm. Uh, that's not, you know, I, I, I was never going to do this thing where it would be like one person would say, you know, who they wanted, but you can tell, um, who, for me, I can tell who is in favor of one candidate over the other. And so you wanted to get people who are in favor of both candidates because it's just the way they speak. Uh -huh. Kind of with kind of a, you know, kind of an affection or, you know, as opposed to you somebody else will be like, tell, yeah, like, she's oh, doing this. She's, uh, she's <laughs> more of the people and she's more, you know, she likes to get things oh, done. That, that person, I said, <laughs> Is talking. She said, "Oh, she's oh, just boys," and then she was like, "The other person is just more down to earth." I said, "Yeah, yeah." So you, yeah, you tried to have people who, you know, some people were were, were more sly than that. She was very. I was like, I know who you are. <laughs> so it, yeah, so it's helpful to. That's the only push back because people feeling like maybe it's, it, but it's not pitting two black women against each other at all. As 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 you watch it, you can tell like it's a celebration of both of them. It is a celebration mm -hmm. of what's going on. It's historic, and then and then come to find out what happened, what that what happened throughout the state of Louisiana mm -hmm. was uh, pretty dope as well. So it was mm -hmm. it was something. We have an oh we have another question. Here we go from our third host. 
Yes, Neil. <laughs> love you. Yeah. I'm gonna read it. So, okay, where Sheba and Jarvis intent oh, well, where Sheba and Jarvis Jarvis intentionally mm -hmm. included because of the impact of their commentary and connection to black people in the city. Yes, is the answer to that. <laughs> um, so both of those, they're both um in uh Sheba Shrek has a show that um had both of them on. And uh, so I wanted to include her. She also just really, because she is, knows so much about the issue in these candidates, she was so smart in how she talked to the both of them. And so I knew I wanted them in there. And Jarvis, I mean, Jarvis was on Roland Martin's show and said so many smart things. It was hard not to use all of it. Uh, but he's included it, to also give people people a window into people who are truly active in the community. And so if you watch it and you're New Orleanian, you know that these are, you know, beloved people. Jarvis though, he did his interview in like a parking structure on Roland Martin's show. And let me tell you, every time I look at it, I'm like, Jarvis, why? Because <laughs> I have to look at it on a big screen. But um, you so gonna get this information regardless. You gonna get this <laughs> oh work. You gonna get this work. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking though. I was like, I will never do an interview in a parking structure ever because I never know how someone's gonna use it. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they were both. They were both. That's what your editor. How was your editor? Uh, how was the relationship oh, yeah. with your editor? So. Um, uh, first, I, I should shout out Zach Manuel, who is an amazing filmmaker, a black guy who did the color correction and is a DP. Uh, and that's why I hired him because I think DPs, if you can't like use a colorist, if you can use a DP, they are, have an eye for color organically. So mm -hmm. I had Zach do it because I knew that he had a great eye for color. Um, my editor, this woman, Lindsay Phillips, so she and I had worked together on another short doc. She, I mean, she's amazing. And it took, you know, it took a while to edit because it took a while to really find the structure. So, you okay. know, it took, first it was like, can we figure out how to do it without the drone footage? Then once we had the drone footage, that solved a lot of problems. Right. Then how do you use the kind of throwback to the black women, how, you know, that whole thing. So it was, it was, it was challenging. It took a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, because those are those are the heroes that are behind the scenes that a lot of people don't really get to know about. Because when it mm -hmm. goes out, it's usually the subject matter, the subject, the subjects of the documentary, and mm -hmm. the director, writer. It goes out mostly mm -hmm. the time when it comes to things and our unsung heroes uh, of you know our colorists, our locations, people who actually have relationships sometimes with the uh, with the subjects. And you're our uh, all of below the line, our sound mixers who put themselves in some of the most awkward, awkward uh, positions mm -hmm. to grab that audio for you. I We had a guy that was inside of a, uh, a you go into another gangway to go into a basement with his boom pumping out because we wanted to film our subject in his backyard, which is beautiful, but it was the mm -hmm. most worst to shoot it. But we got, wow. the, we got the image, but man, mm -hmm. we got out there as fast as we can. But, uh, <laughs> Shout out to everybody behind the scenes. That's what I'm saying. You got to be shout yeah. out to everybody behind the scenes on a documentary uh, mm -hmm. and below the line because those people give it, give their energies as well. And we appreciate yeah. it very much so. Yeah. For real. So, Angela, would you like to say something before we pull you off? Say a couple words before you get out of here? I actually, I have one more question. Oh, you do? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. My, well, oh, this kinda, it kind of goes into your, into your closing. Um, <laughs> What, with people watching this, what do you want them to take away from the story? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I want particularly Black women to have conversations around not just the importance of voting and voting. I know many of us are going to do that, but do it. Um, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but you know. Um, but, uh, you know, also. Oh, so Y'all see, see the film. You know who to vote for. <laughs> but, uh, but they, um, but also just to create a space that for Black women to have real conversations about the things that we want and really investigate politicians who can get us the things that we want. Uh, because I think that, you know, 
particularly, and this is something that, you know, a lot of people talk about, but the presidential election is very important, but there are a lot of small local elections that are also more important and that affect your day-to-day life in a bigger way. So, you know, I want people to think about those elections and to participate in those elections and to talk about what's important to them. Also want to say people should follow All Skin Folk, Inc. Kin Folk on Facebook. Uh, You can follow Tucker Girl, Inc. on Instagram. But um, we have a grant for people to do small group screenings. Uh, We'll give you a discussion guide. We'll give you a screening fee. And so you should... Do you, if you can do some, if you're interested in doing screenings before the election, reach out to us on, uh, you can do it on Facebook or um, you can do it on Instagram. So be sure to reach out to do your own screenings. Yeah. Nice. That mm-hmm. is nice. Mm-hmm. Super, super nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Wow. So mm-hmm. are there any more questions? No, I'm good. That was the last one I had. Um, okay. Yeah. Because what we do over here at a short, at, at a short break, Angela, is because we are super respectful of the time. Now, if you would like to continue, we let you keep going. But a short break officially ends once your film ends for the second time. So mm-hmm. we just want to make sure we're respectful of your time and we appreciate yep. you. Uh, hello? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Angela? Okay, cool. Uh, again, would you like you gave about out you gave out your social media? Is there anything you what what, what else? What's next? Yes. What are you, what are oh, you, what's you, next? Um, what's next? Angela? Well, I produced a feature documentary called Belly of the Beast. That's on. That's going to be on Independent Lens on PBS November twenty third. So you can check that out. Uh, it's about. Uh, black women sterilized in prisons in California. Oh, so uh, wow, um, wow. That, that's coming out. And um, and Mary J. Blige did an original song for it, so that's exciting. Yeah. And uh, and then I have a, a fiction feature that I'm shooting in the spring, summer of next year. Is this your first narrative feature? My second. Second, second. narrative. What's the first a, narrative? Yeah, I did. My first narrative is this film called All Styles. It's okay. on um, Amazon and iTunes now. It's a, a fun okay. dance film, like some people film. So you think you can dance and that kind of stuff. So okay, uh, no time. So this is this is my second one. Okay, nice, nice, nice. All right, yeah. cool. So uh, we, well, thank you, Angela, for being on a short break. We're going to pull you off. We're going to talk to you in the green in, in the green. Thank you so much for yes, being thank here. You for having me. Are they, what'd you say? I'm sorry. Say it again. Oh, I just said thank you for having me. Ah, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Talk to you soon. Well, Emma, there we go. We have it. We got to show up. How you feel? Yeah, I feel great. That film was um, really, really good. I loved Angela and everything that she did in that. I love the direction of it. I love the color in it, like we talked about. Um, I love the Black women's voices that she said. Literally, it, this is going to be a short doc film and it's going to have black women's voices and you're going to hear them and you're going to hear them loud and clear and you're going to have to focus on them. So that's like the one thing that I really took away and I really, really, really enjoyed that. Um, and I'm glad to be able to meet her. I love a short break where I get to meet so many amazing, dope um, black creatives and black women creatives. That's like really, really, it really inspires me to be like, okay, girl. You can be great out here. So, yeah, oh, I'm just so happy. That is great. That is purpose. That's the purpose of a short break, to hustle and motivate. So we are super excited about that. Um, thank you, Will. We'll see. I'm going to uh, one quick thing. So uh, I'm going to pull you off, Emma. You want to say, you had any last words you want to say to the people? Uh, detangle the vote. Make sure y'all go out and vote on November 3rd, whether you're doing an absentee ballot like your girl here, but I'm actually going to take it and take it, take my ballot and put it in the box type situation because I don't trust the mail right now. So make sure you all do that or go get in line or vote early. Make sure you do that. I'll see y'all later. Peace. My good people. Um, hey, we had another great short break and I just want to say one more time what about our brother Thomas Jefferson Bird, man. This man was a titan. Um, theater, film, television, 
I get on the bus. Nola Darling's uh, father, you know, this, she's got to have a Netflix. He has worked throughout generations. Style, pizzazz, the man had a grace. Uh, we are going to miss him. Um, it's it, we just going to miss him. And uh, beautiful soul. Always had a had a joke. Had a great conversation. Which knew about his knew his fight game was about his boxing game. And over all around, just just dope guy. And I'm going to miss hanging uh, with him. And you know, from this energy, whenever whenever I got a we had a chance to cross each other's paths. Um, yeah, shout out to all his, his family. Shout out to all his friends that are impacted. Uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, we have another, you know, legend up there hanging out with the rest. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for checking out a short break. We got another another one coming up soon. Peace.